Okay, good morning, third period. This is uh, Mr. Aguilar. I unfortunately can't be here today for Napoleon Day, which obviously brings great sadness to my heart, as you all know. Uh, but I have made a YouTube video series uh, to help you in my absence. So let me just quickly review your worksheet. If you can't see what's in front of you, this is the worksheet we worked on last class. And I'll quickly do like a recap of the Napoleon stuff. Uh, you should have the first page of your worksheet done and you should have everything done to question two on page three. But I'll do a quick recap. Remember, we were supposed to talk about whether Napoleon was a hero or an enemy to the revolution following this slideshow. Not today, because I have to finish it with you guys on Wednesday, I think. Uh, you, you will basically, after you get all of your notes on Napoleon, you're going to write an essay, an argumentative essay, arguing whether Napoleon was a hero or an enemy to the revolution. So, so throughout the slides, you're putting some things on the hero side. And then on other days of the slideshow, you're putting stuff on the enemy side, because whatever he does good that helps the revolution, AKA brings greater liberty, egality, and fraternity to the French people. We put that on the left, because he's a hero in that instance. And any time that he does things that are contrary to liberty, egality, and fraternity, you put that on the right, AKA he's hurting the goals of the French revolution. Because again, this guy is super disputed. This guy is super um, controversial. So you have to decide based off of the evidence provided to you whether or not you think he's a hero or villain and you need to utilize evidence. So this T-chart, this thing right here, it's basically going to act as your uh, essay outline. So make sure you do this part really well, but also answer the questions. All right. Quick recap. We talked about Napoleon's unique upbringing in question one, what class he was born into and how this caused complications for his great ambition. It was this slide. Yeah, remember, he wasn't born in France. He was born in the French Empire technically by a year because he was born in Corsica. So again, he spoke Italian first and then had to learn a different dialect of Italian. And then he learned French eventually. So he's always going to have an accent and he's always going to be ridiculed for that. So that's obviously going to be hard for him. Also, he's from lower nobility, so he's pretty poor. Also, his father dies when he's 15, so he has to be the main money maker for his family while he's at school, which is a military school which we also talked about. He wasn't allowed to have like the coolest job at the time, which was an artillerist as opposed to uh, like an infantryman or a cavalry officer, which we'll get into today. But basically, he was basically born in almost Italy, but technically he was just made France a year before he was born. Uh, so he's always gonna have an accent and he has to learn French. He's also gonna be poor and his dad's gonna be dead. And he has to have like a crappy job compared to other people. So obviously he's got a lot of complications as it says right here. And he's going to have great ambition because even early on, he's going to say crazy stuff like, I was born to be like, uh, what do you say? Like, I'm going to save this country. It was like a 12-year-old. Like and everyone's like, what are you talking about? So yeah, it's going to be really hard to save his country if he has a trash job comparatively and he can't speak the language and he's seen as an outsider and his dad is dead. So he has to work all the time making money. All right, next up. We talked about where slash who Napoleon defeated in the early stages of the French Revolution and how did these victories aid the French Revolution? Well, we saw Napoleon at a young age. He showed military brilliance with our little video. And he managed to defeat the British and Spanish at Toulon. And then he also managed to defeat the Austrians or the Holy Roman Empire in the Italian campaign. Long story short, your answer to question two. Basically, these people, the British, the Spanish, the Holy Roman Empire, and Italy, I guess, we're trying to stomp out the revolution, but by Napoleon defending his country successfully twice, saving his country from invasion twice, one, it's going to make him really popular, but two, these victories aided the French revolution in that it allows it to continue. Because you got to remember, the people are invading France, the people being the French, I mean, not the French, the British, the Spanish, the Italians, these monarchs of Europe are invading France to try to end the revolution. Because they don't like these crazy ideas that France is having. They're worried that these ideas of killing kings and making representative democracies are going to spread to their country. Next up, we talked about the Directory and how Napoleon became leader of France. Basically, the Directory is going to be the leadership prior to Napoleon taking charge. There are that four-man oligarchy that your classmates talked about. Um, but yeah, the Directory for question three, is going to throw Napoleon in jail, or not jail, throw Napoleon in Egypt, hoping that he's going to die or just like lose because they're nervous of his growing power. 
and you're like paranoia much well not really well one because we know in hindsight napoleon does try to take power from them but two, look at this little graph we did on the first page there's one group and then another group takes charge by taking them out and then another group takes charge by taking them out and then another group takes charge by taking them out so the directory is like what's going to stop us from getting taken out and being replaced so they're kind of scared rightfully so obviously um, so they do try to send Napoleon away, hoping he'll die, or at least his popularity will wane. You're obviously going to be a pretty popular guy if you save your country from invasion twice. So they sent him to Egypt, being like, hopefully, you know, they'll like lose or something and everyone will hate him or something. Um, but Napoleon does not lose. I guess he kind of does. He, he loses, well, he wins every battle, but then he loses his naval battle, which wasn't his fault. Now he's stranded in Egypt. Now he's scared that people are going to forget about him, so he zips on back to France, as you can see in this little picture, to take charge. Okay, the last thing we talked about uh, for part one, Napoleon became leader of France through the Brumaire coup, which you see right here. The Brumaire coup. Basically, he militarily overthrows the government. So, like, he takes, like, his soldiers, or some soldiers, he storms the building where they're all, like, making laws or whatever, to make a long story short. And he's like, me and my two best friends, Ciez and some other guy, I forget his name, are now in charge of France. So, you know, that might be something you put in the whole enemy of the revolution box, because that's not very liberty-like if you're just taking control of your nation by force. You know, that's kind of bad. Um, but yeah, after that, Napoleon grows tired of sharing power with his two best friends. They're more like his frenemies. So he creates this new constitution in 18, the year 1800, and he says, um, basically, am I allowed to be leader of France? I mean, dictator of France for life. Yes or no? And everyone, well, not everyone, 82% of France says yes. They're probably like, that's insane. Why would anyone elect someone to be dictator for life? Well, you got to remember, he's a super popular guy because he saved his country from disaster twice. And the governments of France that have ruled before him haven't been very good. And Napoleon does a pretty good job in his first, like, year of power. So people are just like, yeah, we'll give you the reins. And Napoleon gets to be leader or dictator for life. Um, however, he lies and says 99.9% .9 of France voted yes in the box if I'm allowed to be dictator for life. But again, we, like, looked at the documents. Like, in a, like afterwards, historian realized that no is only 82% of France. So he would have won the election anyways, but he wanted to lie about it because he's a master propagandist. I showed you like the little paintings he made to make himself look cool, how he took like Egyptian artwork to try to like cater to like other cultures as well. And then also most importantly, he was the master brander, right? He had like his like little eagle and his like little Napoleonic N spread around everywhere to show like I'm that guy. I'm responsible for making this building, this hospital, this church, this uh, well, not really church, this the school, this bridge. Just reminding you of how cool he is. So everyone knew Napoleon and all the cool stuff he built. So they're like, okay, I'm okay with voting this guy as dictator for life. He seems to know what he's doing. Saved our country twice. Built the local school. I like this guy. And he looks really cool in his paintings. So, you know, people were like, yeah, I'm cool with him being dictator for life. All right. And then we started on the next part, the peak of power. We talked about Napoleon's coronation ceremony. And we said Napoleon at his coronation ceremony, it was a little bit different than other coronation ceremonies. So basically at other coronation ceremonies, um, you're supposed to get the Pope, the leader of the Catholic Church, to crown you king because he's, um, you know, the leader of the Catholic Church, and if the Pope crowns you king, it's kind of showing you that God, kind of, it's showing you that God is okay with you or gives you the right to be king. So Napoleon, uh, he does capture the Pope. He invades Italy, the Papal States, as that area was called at the time. Captures the Pope, and then he's like, okay, Pope, you're going to put the crown on my head, making me king or emperor of France or emperor of the French or else. The Pope's like, oh, I don't want to do that. And Napoleon's like, well, too bad because you're my prisoner. And the Pope said, okay, fine. So then at the coronation ceremony, the Pope's about to put the crown on Napoleon's head, but then what Napoleon does is that that's different. He snatches the crown from the Pope and puts it on his own head, basically saying, I don't need God. I don't need you. I don't need anyone else. I became emperor of my country by my own merit. I did it, me. I don't need you guys. Um, so yeah, you can obviously put that in the... Um, enemy box that's not very egalitarian or e like acting equally 
if you're saying that I'm cooler than everyone by making myself emperor. However, in Napoleon's defense, I mean, this would be his argument. I'm, you can put this on the left-hand side. I'm just telling you his logic. Napoleon said, I'm emperor of the French, not emperor of France. Probably like, what the heck is the difference? Basically he's saying that the French nation, like France itself, is for the people. So he's not leader of, of France. He's not like emperor of the country. Because the country is for the people. He's merely the emperor of the people. The people own the country. So, yeah, you could say, wow, that's kind of cool that Napoleon let his people own the country. But I don't know. You get to decide what you want to do with that. You can put that on the left side or right side, hero or villain. Okay, next up, talked about the Napoleonic Code. This is how I'm going to end the recap video. Because uh, I just wanted to review your notes real quick. Napoleonic code is the most important. Well, I will say one of the three most important words you should have in your essay uh, when you eventually write your essay. Essentially, the Napoleonic code is when Napoleon modernizes the laws of France from Enlightenment ideals. So the Enlightenment is like the kind of stuff that like influenced our constitution. Like, you know, all men are created equal blah, 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 that kind of thing, like John Locke, Rousseau, those philosophers. So Napoleon does that. And the main thing the Napoleonic Code does is, and this is important, is it gets rid of the three estates system. So remember, back in the old days, the estate system, you're like either at the top of society on the first or second estate, or you're at the bottom of the third estate. So if a first estate guy gets in trouble for stealing bread, they'll be like, the, the authorities will be like, oh, you first estate, you guy. Don't steal bread, you silly you. And then he'll get off and it won't be that big of a deal. But if a third estate guy stole bread, then you could just like kill him or something like that. Napoleon gets rid of this and the Napoleonic Code makes it so everyone who is charged for a crime is treated equally. It's like both people would have the same crime, first estate and third estate. But also this Napoleonic Code gets rid of the state system in general. Uh, so yeah, I'm painting it in a very good light. Also, to paint it in an even better light, the Napoleonic Code is largely the law code that most of the modern laws of Europe are based on. So like the German constitution, the Italian constitution, the modern French constitution, they're all based on this law code because it was a very progressive, effective way to create laws. So yeah, I'm making it look really good, but to make it look a little bit worse now, the Napoleonic Code also took away liberties from women and then also like slaves because it reinstated slavery. So that's really not very egalitarian if you ask me, right? Um, but in Napoleon's defense, again, it's kind of weird to defend the guy. But in his defense, he made it – there's no defense of the slavery thing. I, there's, I don't really know how to defend that. But for the woman thing, the Napoleonic Code still gave more liberties to women than anywhere else in France. However – it did not allow women as many liberties as women had from the time period of like 1795 to like 1800. So yeah, women were still better off in France during that time period, but Napoleon did take away some of those liberties. So, okay. All right. The other thing Napoleon did when he took charge of France was he rebuilt France. Like I was talking about, whenever he built something new, he put his little Napoleonic N on it. Like, hey, that was me. Go me. So like whenever you go to France today, you can like see all the bridges and stuff he made. Uh, here's me in France. Me when with Napoleon as he's making his code and I'm looking on proudly like, oh, good job, Napoleon. Like you did some good stuff, did some bad stuff, but it was very progressive for the time, I guess. Cool. And then here's me. Well, I guess I'm not in this picture. I tried to go into Notre Dame, but it like exploded a couple years ago or something like that. So I wasn't allowed in because they were reconstructing it. Okay. That is your review. Now, make sure your notes are good. And then I will make another video, probably two more videos to like do the lesson I was gonna do with you guys if I was there today. I miss you a lot. I miss talking about Napoleon. Um, yeah, make sure you have good notes. Make sure you're nice to your sub. Goodbye.